Caddis Maximus here. This is going to kind of be a longer video because I'm going to do, I'm not going to do a lot of lock videos on this channel, but I've always kind of fiddled with them ever since having a storage unit broken into and cleaned out and having a couple bicycles stolen. I kind of always uh, had a little thing for locks, particularly because one of the bicycles I had stolen, I got back to and uh, I had used the master lock and uh, it was sitting there open. They even take the lock and it was like they had the key. And so that kind of started out what's going on here. And that's always why I've done a few lock videos. This video is going to be ex kind of extended because I'm going to do review basically these Abus locks, which are German locks. Most are made in China, unfortunately, except for their uh, certain models and their big expensive models are still made in Germany. Um, but many of their most common models, such as these, are going to be uh, Main China. I'm also reviewing these because these are the most common Avis locks in the United States. They're also the only ones I have and so they show up a lot on eBay. Uh, I did buy both of these new and then the rest I've actually picked up used. And there's two generations, a first generation and then what they call a series two or the second generation. So there's been a lot of questions. There's a ton of videos about Avis locks on YouTube. Obviously, or I shouldn't say obviously, but 95 to 99 percent of them are picking gutting you know, some of the bigger, uh, the, the two big lock picking YouTubers or lock YouTubers, I should say, lock picking lawyer and Bosnian and Bill have, you know, gone over these several times, but they haven't answered a lot of detailed questions, particularly compatibility parts between the first generation and second generation. Well, first and second gen cores interwork with each other. Can you swap the shackles back and forth? What are some of the differences between the first and second generation besides uh, all the second generation locks have this little print with this little funny shape too. That refer that ref shape is this little piece of metal, which is known as a Z-bar. And it interacts with the little cams that are in there to make it whether it's a key retaining or non-key retaining lock. And it just adjusts the way the back of the lock actuator fits, fills in the space between these two little dogs. This little part, the actual cam that locks the lock. Uh, from a second generation. I'll answer that question first. These locking cams are not interchangeable between first and second generations. And the steel locks have uh, a bit of a different cam than the brass locks. I should also mention that. And on the Series 2 brass locks, for the most part, you can't remove the cams because they have a, like a lock plate in there. Another question to answer is there are some ABUS locks that can be have a vulnerability of bypassing. Although these 83s, it's never been demonstrated on, and I'll kind of show how the uh, actuator works. And it's more like a master lock. Out of uh, all the criticisms of master locks, uh, one of the decent things is that the geometry they've used for how their locks activate, you know, like a common one like one of these, uh, makes it so that you can't bypass them. And it has to do with whether the actuator is parallel with the keyway or perpendicular to the keyway. All these Avis locks act, actuate being perpendicular to the keyway. Uh, and so there are no YouTube videos of 83 series being bypassed. And I even searched the web. I don't know if it's really possible. It may be a l slightly possible on the first generation ones. And I'll end up showing comparing cores to show why that is. But on the second generation ones, there's a piece of metal that actually goes across the back of the core. So you can't even push a tool back in there. So anyway, I'm going to review these, you know, show the compatibility and the kind of the features of them, which are, have been mentioned in other videos, and then kind of go into detail. One thing I really wish the, you know, some of the bigger lock YouTubers would was actually fully disassemble the locks and talk about some of the engineering. Nobody seems to want to do that, and that always seems to be what I'm interested in, so that's why I'm making this video. I'll do some comparisons and that kind of thing as well. Anyway, back to that piece of metal. Most padlocks um, just work normally. You take in a key, you can just put it in, unlock it, turn the key back, get the lock locked up, and it works normally. On these Abus 83 series, they, that little piece of metal, once again, allows you to choose whether the lock holds on to the key until you lock it back up or whether it works more like a traditional padlock. And for the most part, it's fine. Uh, I you know, and the brass ones almost all the time, they'll be set to key retaining. On the big steel ones, not so much, even though the key retaining is advertised as a security feature. And the easiest way to demonstrate it would be like this. 
is this would be key retaining where I have it unlocked and now the key cannot be removed from the lock. And so that does a couple things. It's less likely that you are to leave it uh, unlocked and hanging somewhere to get lost or missing or something like that. Uh, secondly, since your keys are in the lock, you always remember to uh, get your keys out. And the only way that happens is when the lock is uh, in its locked position. So for companies and that kind of stuff, it makes a lot of sense because somebody can unlock this from a gate and rather than just sitting there all day unlocked, they have to unlock it from the gate and then like attach it to the fence and relock it to the fence in order to get their keys back out. And that way the locks, you know, don't, don't end up growing legs quite as much. They also have uh, another distinct uh, feature of key retaining, meaning that since the key can't physically turn back, it means that when these get really old and rusty, and they will after decades, and these also have a quick change shackle, quick shackle change feature where you don't have to completely disassemble the lock and pull out the bearings to replace a really old and rusty shackle, which is a big concern on the brass ones because these things can last an indefinite amount of time. I mean, decades. The brass itself can last decades, but the seal shackle will end up rusting, particularly if you're near, you know, salt water or where they salt the roads. And they have a feature where you can just drop the core and use a, uh, you know, they advertise a special tool. You just use a flathead screwdriver and it, you can replace the shackles pretty easily. Also, to answer a, uh, one of the compatibility questions, whether besides knowing that yours is a, sec a second generation uh, saying series two, first generations just don't say anything. They just are like this. Uh, they did actually used to print made in China. This is a very old one. You know it because it says made in China. The core only says 300. And for the longest time, they've had the word patented on them. So we know this is an early one. And I'm sure it probably took a hit on sales. So they stopped stamping right on the lock made in China, even though they all still are. Shackle compatibility. So the first generations have special alloy. This is a first generation lock, but I have managed to get a Nano Protect second generation shackle in there. There is a difference, and that difference is in the cutouts. What they did is on the Nano Protect, they've moved the cutout a little bit higher just to get a little bit more meat under it. And they've made some uh, adjustments to the dimensions on the lock body of the second generation to accommodate that. So the second generation Nano Protect shackles sometimes will work in first generation locks. Uh, it just depends if you happen to get a Nano Protect shackle that has uh, had this little cutout made just a little bit below specification. That'd be the best way to say it. But generally speaking, the first, the second generation shackles won't work in the first generation because the sh cutout's too high. And so the end of the shackle ends up hitting the top of the screw before the ball bearings can fully seat themselves. And so the cam won't turn and it won't fully lock itself. Anyway, I digress. About the key retaining feature, the last thing is since the cam is mechanically linked using this little piece of metal to take up the space, if you have a real rusty lock and say it doesn't want to lock properly, you because the, now the core is mechanically linked to the locking cam, you can force the key into the closed, you can force the shackle in, force the key to the closed position and pull it out, and you can mechanically force the lock closed, and you're not stuck in a situation where the lock isn't really locking, um, and then you have to kind of push it or bang it around until it wants to lock. You just wrench the key backwards, you know, push it shut, wrench the key backwards, and you know, remember next time you got to bring some oil. And so that is kind of a nice aspect of it. Or if it's really cold and it's kind of frozen or just filled with uh, dirt and mud, uh, it add, does add a little bit of security there. The last thing I'll say about shackles is for some reason on the super long ones, I've only ever seen them say just harden. They never said special alloy or nano protect. Maybe on the newest ones they have, but it, that's always kind of puzzled me is, why only on the very long shackle do they have just the word hardened on it. Continuing on with the re review part, they are generally have excellent fit and finish. That's one thing is even though they're made in China, uh, it is a German lock company and they really uh, pay attention to the fit and finish. And even though they come out of China, they really make a good effort to uh, get good vendors and tell them that they will not be doing business with them anymore if they uh, 
don't really take care in machining these. So they always have really nice tolerances. They're always really symmetrical, uh, really pretty nice. It has changed a little bit on the steel locks, but for the most part, you, when you get an ABIS lock, you're expecting something that's uh, pretty much near perfection. They do have smaller versions of these, which are uh, aluminum body. They have brass body. Surprisingly enough, uh, it's uh, and maybe I wasn't didn't run into the right model, but it seems that uh, even the three these are five sixteen shackles. Even the three eighth shackle, um, it looks like steel with a chrome plated brass body, and you have to go all the way up to these seven sixteenths or eleven millimeter shackle locks to really get the true hardened steel. And these are pretty expensive. Uh, this one I probably overpaid. Uh, you can find them for around forty dollars from the right play, right websites. This was on Amazon, and I ended up paying like forty-seven dollars. So they're not cheap, but this is, uh, in my opinion, for forty-seven bucks, is probably one of the best locks as far as physical build quality that you can really get in that particular price range. Uh, this is the eighty-three CS fifty-five. This really is a beast. And it has a number of advantages over what is the most common locks in the U.S., which would be like these older Master 930s. The ones that are really in the store now are these Magnum ones, which are physically are a pretty nice lock. But, you know, there's a million YouTube videos about how Master locks do not have much pick resistance. And then, of course, American Lock's a Master Lock brand, and so there are these American Lock versions. I don't recommend these American Lock uh, at all because... Uh, even though it's a nice lock, they have extremely small ball bearings in them, and I never really like that. But this is more about the Avis locks. So any of the ones that say rock are going to be solid steel. So they have these, and then they have one which is the 83 CS80, so 3 and an eighth inches or something like that. So they do have a massive one. One other note is many of these, uh, you or, there's two different keyways. You can get a variety of keyways. These do take what are known as front door keys or deadbolt keys, standard uh, keys. And they have like 20 different cores that you can get. Schleg is the most common. But you have to be careful. And I've some of these I got off of eBay for a pretty good deal, but I understand why. Is there's also this core, which is advertised as Schleg S2 or Schleg P or Schleg Professional. You don't want to get that. You want to get the Schleg C, which is this little S-shaped. We don't have enough light here. There we go. So the normal Schlage is a S shape, which makes it you know harder for people to pick just because there's less space in there. This Schlage P is just cavernous. It's super easy to pick just because there's so much space and you can get uh, you know crowbars in there. The reason they have this core is because one, it's compatible with a variety of different Schlage keys and even some other keys, uh, I believe from Wiser or Quickset. So it's kind of like a universal one. So if a company's changing over to Abus locks, they can sell them the Schlage P core and it's plug and play. They can just pin these locks up and the company doesn't even have to redistribute keys. And I don't know if I mentioned, but in the United States, there's Master Lock and their American Lock division which is probably number four. ABIS is probably uh, number three. Excuse me, I should say Master Lock American Lock is number three. ABIS is probably number two. And this is institutionalized. So this is all these big businesses, all uh, government institutions, this, you know, institutionalized locks. Uh, the uh, I'm sure 80% plus, 90% of the market is controlled by Master Lock American Lock, ABIS, and best access systems. And I don't have any best locks because they are outrageously expensive. A little brass best lock like this will be 50 bucks. And I've never been able to swallow that price. And because of that, they're always really expensive on eBay. So I actually don't own any best locks because they are always just outrageously overpriced, in my opinion. For their special little core, you get the privilege of just paying some ridiculous premium. For the same 50 bucks, you can get this huge 716 sha closed shackle, you know, billet hardened steel padlock. And this thing is heavy duty. On the steel versions, they do have anti drill pins, two in the top part and two in the lower part. Although they probably could still use steel uh, key pins just to add to the, to the drill protection. It is a brass core. They just chrome plated on the steel locks where they just leave it as a natural brass on the brass locks. There is something else about these cores, and I'll describe that in a minute, but the ones that say C6A have this option to quickly adjust them from 5 to 6 pin. 
Uh, it's a little gimmicky, but, you know, they're just trying to add something to the locks. They also have just a variety of different numbers. Some of these are C6A3000, and I'm not sure what the difference is between a C6A3000 or a C... This is a 3000. Uh, this one is a C6A300. So they've had various numbers, but as far as I know, they're all interchangeable. And I'll show in a minute... The cores are compatible. The Series 1 and Series 2 cores are interchangeable, which is a good thing. And they pretty much kind of had to make it that way, at least for the cores, because there's no way that ABIS was going to say, we're coming out with a second generation lock and none of your old lock parts work. It's one thing for the shackles not to work, but when you have a lock that's designed to have, uh, that aren't best, but they are pretty easy to change the cores because it's a whole cartridge system. So you can just undo a screw and the whole cartridge pops out and you can either uh, quickly put in new pins in this core or just pop in another core that you already have keyed up and be on your way. I should mention all ABIS locks come with, uh, they're reasonably pick resistant. I've custom pinned both of these, you know, uh, ordered off of eBay, just some secu a security pin kit and it had a variety of shapes such as T pins and things like that. So, like in my American lock, how to intelligently pin a lock, I did the same thing with these. So, so now these have like a couple of T-pins. They have what's known as a hat pin, which actually comes from Avis locks. Uh, short spools, long spools. So they, these are real pick resistant because I really wanted to be confident in a lock that uh, somebody was physically going to have to use an angle grinder on, make some noise, and put in some effort. That's the whole point to padlocks. They are all, quote-unquote, honesty. But when you have big padlocks like these, somebody's going to know they're going to have to put in some effort. Uh, and if they don't have those giant, you know, 42-inch bolt cutters, and if they don't have a cordless angle grinder, then they're going to have to put in quite a bit of work. They're actually pretty secure if you don't have huge multi-foot pry bars, multi-foot bolt cutters, or cordless angle grinders. And yes, there's plenty of criminals who do have that kind of stuff. But you also have to consider the likelihood of a criminal having those items who happens to be attacking whatever you're attacking, say your storage unit that you have locked up, or maybe construction equipment or something like that. With construction equipment, those criminals are, tend to be pretty hardcore. But uh, when it comes to locks, you know, don't make it too easy for anybody. So all ABIS locks, but they have reasonable pick resistance. They all come with one of these little pins, uh, these little serrated pins, and then five of these spools. Yep, I have a little bit of flaky skin. One of the reasons I don't show my face is because I have that kind of uh, eczema or psoriasis, whatever you call it, over my face. So I already get enough criticism about my fingernails. I don't need it for my face. On these 83 series, they just go by their width. So the A345 are 45 millimeters. These 55s are 55 millimeters wide, uh, etc. 83 would be the series of locks. So if it's an ABUS 83 anything, it will take these exact same cores, which is kind of nice. When they add the word CS, it just means closed shackle for them. But it's just these shackle guards, just like these. You know, we have the 83CS55 and then just the standard 8355. One other thing about the ABIS locks, and this is actually common for master locks and many lock manufacturers, is when you get these guarded shackle versions, they have a shorter shackle. These lock bodies are actually... Uh, the same billet of steel, they just left more, they just machined out these extra shackle guards on top. But what we can see is that this non-guarded has a taller shackle. Yes, you can put this shackle in here if you need a little bit of extra space, if you really like the guarding, but it's just a little too tight, which is a nice uh, option to do, because you can, from a locksmith, order just the shackle. But they were thinking about it, so this version tends to have a, this one has a little bit taller shackle just for more general use. Uh, and then when you're using one of these guarded shackle locks, they assume that it's going to be around some kind of hasp or, you know, something like that. So you really want the shackle just totally tucked away as tight as possible. So there, even with an angle grinder, somebody's going to have to go through all this cross section of steel. And with that 716 shackle and this guarding, I mean, uh, that's a big old chunk of steel right there to have to try to cut through. Abus makes nice attention to detail. As we can see, there's this... A uh, piece of uh, guarding right here actually has a tapered shape to it. And if we unlock it here, we can see that that coincides with the, since the shackle is rotating on an arc, it kind of traces a even distance. And it gives a, just a little bit more meat right there. 
which I thought was a nice attention to detail. Even like American lock, like this one, uh, they just cut it straight. So that is one of the th aspects of an Abus that does make it pretty darn nice. Uh, they do a real good job. You know, all the edges here all have been chamfered all throughout there. They actually didn't get these inside edges right here. Uh, but it's either been tumbled or just the heavy chrome plating there. It isn't sharp, you know, and they, of course, chamfer around the bottom. So it's all real nice. And these locks are important. They always have some kind of uh, stamping. Unlike, you know, Master Lock, ABIS, if they have some s severe issues, people, they'll ask. If you're doing a warranty, they'll find out that it's a UH lock. Um, or they'll find out that it's a VD lock. And I don't want to hear jokes about how my lock has VD. Which indicates a company, you know, that is keeping track of their products because if they have a bunch of VD locks uh, that have a particular issue, then they're going to figure out, you know, they're going to get to the bottom of what's going on there. As far as I know, I don't know if I talked about earlier, this video is getting a little bit long, but I'm going to end it pretty soon here, um, is bypassing. Uh, when they talk about ABUS locks or American locks being bypassed, it's because of the way the actuators work. Something like a master lock will have this cutout pieces which what which is what actually activates the cam uh, parallel to the keyway and that geometry makes it very difficult to get a long flat tool somehow you know up in there and then around the 90 degrees and then far enough over to where you can actually say get a hold of the little pegs and rotate the lock unlocked American locks have an issue where they do have a bypass and they have to have these special wafers in them because there this uh, piece is actually cut parallel so it's on the side of the keyway and so what that means is you can get a tool all the way through the keyway that has like a little flat thing and then they just push it downwards and they're able to unlock the lock the problem the when it's perpendicular to when the the notch is perpendicular to the keyway uh that tool has to be rotated 90 degrees and then has to be pushed in far enough to rotate the cam and that is what it's nearly impossible and and gets rid of bypass issues. And so the ABIS, even the first generation, has a parallel to keyway actuator. And on the Series 2, they have an interchangeable tailpiece that actually blocks the back of the keyway. So they're really not bypassable. Any bypass videos on YouTube are not of 83 series. There is none. And if I didn't mention earlier, I'll mention again, the little locking cams are not really removable out of the Series 2 brass ones. It is different on the steel ones, and they're not compatible with the first generation anyway. It's the one known absolutely incompatible part is the actuator. This is out of a Series 2. They use a special locking uh, clip that goes over the top of this to hold it into these locks, and it's nearly impossible to pull it out. Basically, if you get to a point where you may need to replace this cam, you just get a whole new lock body. On these 8345 brass ones, it is, once again, it is different on the steel ones. This is what one of the second generation ones looked like. I have, you know, rammed one out to see what it would do or what, you know, what it was. And the shackle change feature works by when you unlock the lock, it goes this, or excuse me, it is locked this way. When you unlock it, then you have this deep cutout, so that's the open end of the shackle and allows the ball to retract far enough for the shackle to pop out. This shallow cutout is on the closed end of the shackle, so it allows the shackle to slip up. And let me unlock this. And so these, all these shackles have a little flat part down the bottom there. And that rides in this shallow cut. So the shackle change feature is just putting in a slot head screwdriver and rotating it even further. And this will actually push this ball bearing back out some, but the lock shackle isn't in there, so there is no issue. To so the second deeper cutout, which is deep enough for that ball, the closed shackle side ball, to sink in far enough for you to yank out the uh, shackle. They show a special tool. Most people have that special tool themselves. It's called a stubby flathead screwdriver. I'll show how that works in a second here. I don't have the 80, but some people may want to know kind of how big these locks are. These are all 516 shackle locks, and we know they're 45 millimeters, so about one and three quarter inches. They're, you know, about an average size. But these 83 CS55 is one of the biggest locks Avis makes. I believe the 83 CS80 is the largest. They don't make a half inch shackle. It seems to jump from these 716 shackle to a giant 5 8 shackle lock, which costs well over $100. 
But once again, like this closed shackle is almost the same size as a king pack of cigarettes. But if we were to compare it with some other more common locks that people have seen, it would be like this master lock here. Let's push these out of the way. So this is a 930. This used to be the like the biggest, baddest master lock that you could really find on any store shelves. They oftentimes have a really long shackle, or they have I got one with a shorter shackle here. And these have always have you know nice oversized ball bearings. Everything's been great. Just the master locks always had terrible cores until you learn that they have this model 410 plastic safety lock that they thought people wouldn't buy if it was $4 and not trust. So instead they charged $12 for a plastic lock and put one of their most secure cores that you can find in any master lock <laughs> in a plastic safety lock. So you basically, uh, nowadays they've replaced it with these magnums. So you buy one of these magnums and then you buy one of those safety locks just to take it apart and use its six pin core with all its security pins because it just drops in one of these master locks. So you end up spending $40 then you can have one of these magnums with a six pin high security core. And we can see there's just a ton of steel in these Abus locks. Uh, they are a little bit narrower than the round body locks. They are just a little bit thinner. These round body locks have always had extra thick bodies for some reason. I'm not so sure of it. They claim the round body is uh, more secure because uh, it's harder to hit it with a hammer. But there's actually a YouTube video, which is padlocks and irons. It's about firefighters and situations where their power saws may not work and they may not have access to them. So they have a tool called a halligan, and then they use it with sledgehammers. And they can bust open pretty much any padlock anybody has using those two tools. It's really pretty surprising. But in that video, they showed that this lock could take a beating. And if this one could take a real beating and a lot of effort from two firefighters using sledgehammers and the special uh, lock breaking tools, these Abus locks are much, much stronger. And for a couple reasons. One, uh, the master locks on these, they use brass locking cams, you know, brass like this, which comes in these 8345 uh, series. On the Master Lock Pro Series, I've even got ones like this. Here's another size comparison. This is 6627. These often have a, uh, uh, or almost always have this uh, big plastic boot and weather protective shield over them. And I really, those just annoy the beans out of me because the weather protective shield works great if you keep the shackle oil, but most shackles get dry. And then the rubber boot, the seal ends up getting rolled up and fails. And then the whole protective cover now becomes a bath and so the whole lock just rusts away inside it so i tend to just to remove those darn covers uh this is a huge master lock this 6627 allows you to use what is known as key and knob cylinders so you can put uh medico which are like super expensive very high security cores. so these are actually a master lock that you can put whatever core you want in and make them extremely pick resistant and this is about the equivalent about the same size as these abis uh, rocks. This is almost, you know, the exact equivalent here. And so one of the issues, um, oh, and so I didn't mention on the Abus, on these rock versions, at least these 8355s, this little cam is actually steel. And so they are super duper secure. They're actually the only locks I have that are ball bearing locking with actual locking cam itself is also steel. So everything associated, the body, the shackle, the bearing balls, and the locking cam is all steel in these Abus uh, rocks. So they are truly heavy duty. If I unlock one here, we can see that it does have nice large cutouts, so very large ball bearings. That's why I don't recommend these American locks. Even though these are pretty nice, the big issue with these American locks, here we go, is that they use really small ball bearings. And there actually is a couple YouTube videos of firefighters attacking these, and they actually break into them pretty fast just because American, for some reason, use really small, uh, undersized ball bearings on their 7 16 locks. Uh, and they, you just have to recommend against that. I don't know why they never change that, but it's really uh, in pretty gross error. And here's an American 5 16 shackle 5300, so you can see how much... Uh, just heavier duty this is than even the versus the American lock. American, I'll say, is the exception. Where even master lock, where you have these guarded shackles, are very uh, tight. They use an extra short shackle. On the American locks, they don't. They just put in extra tall guarding. Oh, I didn't. I forgot to mention also that the other big difference between besides not only having nice large ball bearings and these big master locks also have nice large ball bearings all three of these do 
um, is the big difference is that this, the reason they have this cut out is because there's very deep bores. And we can see how deep that is. That is super deep in there. There's just a whole bunch of steel to help support the shackle against any kind of twisting or bending or tax. And so I really appreciate that. It really is a very strong and heavy duty lock. And even though this master lock here is laminated, which makes it weaker in many instances, being squared off is actually nice because it supports, really supports the shackle against twisting attacks. And in that firefighting video I mentioned earlier, when they did break this lock, they actually weren't able to hammer it just against the, even though it has a brass actuator and cheaper master locks uh, like this one, uh, oftentimes will come with zinc, which is terrible. Uh, they didn't actually get the bearing balls to retract. They did break the shackle, but that was taking a wedge and putting it into the shackle and then using a sledgehammer to expand it out until it broke. Oh, and also to mention earlier about the safety lock. When you do that, you do get this cool key that says do not duplicate. And so you have this master magnum that is very unique. They truly are six pins. And it just is literally a plug and play. But the other issue with these round body padlocks, as we can see here, is that the cutouts, particularly on this side, they do them offset. And that's due to, I believe, a space constraint that's in there. But when it's in its closed position here, this cutout ends up being right about here. And so there isn't any metal supporting it. So when they broke this lock, it was because it sheared off and broke right there where that cutout is, where the metal is thinner, because it is not properly supported and it's set so high up, which is not an issue on these Abuses. And I'm sure that one of these uh, locks may not have been able to be failed via that method using Halligan tools and wedges and sledgehammers. And I'll move these out of the way and do one other size comparison. This is one of the biggest master locks. This is a, a big stainless steel with a long shackle, really wide. So this is about the only lock that really uh, compares from master uh, to this Abus. And this Abus is way heavier duty than this master lock 15. But uh, just for raw size, Master does have these. And I actually found these on Lowe's website for $18. I couldn't believe it. Master says uh, 53 on their website. Probably the best lock deal I've ever uh, picked up. So that's the only lock from Master besides some of these that really equivalates it. Even though these locks are certainly much more secure than what one of these is. And just for giggles, I did buy off of eBay one of those Sergeant and Greenleaf environmental locks. Uh, which are massive. This has a 916 shackle, and this is the only thing that really, I would say, dwarfs uh, these Abus locks. Although, to tell you the truth, uh, they use centered metal on these Sergeant and Greenleafs, and I don't know if they're really as good as what everybody thinks they are. That's really the bottom line. The shackles are super thick, but they're a uh, conception that you can't have these. Uh, you can. Sergeant Greenleaf sells these on a civilian. They're on Amazon. They're just like $200. And so you get these off of eBay because you get ones that are, you know, some kind of government or industrial facility or whatever uh, is de-assetting, selling the locks on eBay. So many times you can get these where there's ind keys are sold independently of the locks. So you can get a lock for 20 or 30 bucks and then find a key. And the keys are actually pretty hard to find. So they end up going for another 20 or 30 bucks on eBay. Still a lot cheaper than the $150 to $200 uh, that they retail for. They are pretty heavy duty, but uh, there are no YouTube videos of people who are like really testing how hard it is to cut these and how much of a beating they can take. So we really don't know. I'm not going to sacrifice this one. I don't even have the facilities to properly uh, test a lock. But to tell you the truth, I would think that even these 716 shackle Abuses would really be pretty competitive. Uh, against the Sergeant and Greenleaf environmental padlock. Primarily because these are a billet through hardened steel and this is uh, sintered. So it's still pretty hard and pretty good seal, but sintered uh, steel is not as good as billet. Anyway, this video is way too long, but it's just for people out there who really just want to get all the details about these ABUS locks. I think I'm going to finish up. I'll pause it. I'm going to pull out these cores just so people can 
uh, feel confident and I will actually show that all the different cores are interchangeable with the different versions. Uh, I also did forget to mention that the Z bars, that little piece of metal that makes it from key retaining to non key retaining, is also unique. The Z bar for the first generation is much different from the Z bar for the second generation. Also, I completely forgot to mention that there is one uh, thing that I've also never seen to really discussed about these ABIS locks is that there is a, uh, on the brass, it's not true with these steel ones, but on these brass ones here, if I can get my flashlight, so all these locks, they just have a Phillips head screw down there. Now on these brass ones, that screw is happens to be aligned right with the drain hole. That little shiny thing in the hole is actually the edge of that screw. And so what happens is, especially outside, is over use cycles, a bunch of being unlocked and relocked a bunch of times and thermal cycles, that screw will get loose and you periodically need to check on it. And when you reassemble these, you need to get it pretty tight. Otherwise, I just loosened the screw a little bit just to see if that was true. And so I'm sure, you know, if I can test it out at home, that there are ones where the cores is going to be a little bit loose. And if that screw is loose, then you can just use a little pick and just go in there and actually unscrew the screw that retains the core on these brass ones. So if you have anybody, uh, if you use any of these brass ones, be aware of that. Make, always make sure that the screws are tight in those. Also, on the steel ones here, let me show that again. They didn't, they, the screws align with the drain hole, but they did something different. And I don't know why they didn't do it in the brass ones besides maybe there just wasn't space. And it's kind of hard to see, but the, on the steel ones, the screw is actually countersunk into the steel body. So when you look through the side of the drain hole, it's offset a little bit below the floor that's in that inside that bore, but you have no access to the screw. That screw, it does, even if it is loose, uh, has to be extremely loose to be able to use a pick tool. Otherwise, uh, you're not going to be able to unscrew it through the drain hole. And as far as drilling it out, there's no way around it. You do have to drill through a significant cross section of hardened steel to get at the screw. And so they don't have that vulnerability on these steel ones. And I did want to point that out. Okay, I'm going to pause it for a second and pull Cora, the uh, uh, brass series two a brass series one and one of these steel locks just so you can see that they're all interchangeable. So quickly, this is the little window that they use when it says C6A, that's a window so you can quickly just pop in pins to make it six pins, uh, where all the older ones don't have that little window. And then of course on series two, they actually say series two right on the sides of the cores like these. There is one difference, the cores, the difference, the spacing from the very end of the tailpiece to the face of the lock is just a little bit longer. Here's the difference between the Series 1, where it's machined in place. Series 2, you can see this metal bar actually blocks off the pack, back, back of the keyway, and so they're really not bypassable. But since it's horizontal, I already think they can't be bypassed anyway. The Z-bar shape does change, so of course... Uh, on the first generation or second generation, it looks just like that. I was showing it earlier. I don't know. It fell on the floor and I don't know where it is. Uh, on the first generation, the Z bar has this really sharp shape. And the idea with these is you put it in with a dot up and then it fills in the space and makes it key retaining and kind of locks the core. So it, uh, it makes it, you know, extra secure. And then you don't, you can remove it. And that's what I recommend if you don't want it to be key retaining. The idea is that you can put it in backwards like this, and then those little feet put it the other way, and so you can still have a little piece of metal in there, then it becomes non-key retaining. The one issue is, is that these pieces of metal prevent the little locking cam from fully returning to its closed position. The lock still locks, but not quite as securely as if you have this Z-bar removed. So that's generally what I recommend, is that you either use the Z-bar if you want to have it, key retaining or just completely pull the whole thing out if you don't to make it you know truly uh, totally secure um, but even though there is just a very slight length difference as we can see that the series 2 are a little bit longer we can take this series 2 core and this is indeed the series 1 lock and that core will go oh this is pretty tight really tight tolerances. The other thing is the Series 1's had super tight tolerances. 
if I can get this in here. The tolerances all all around were actually much tighter on the first generation, and they actually loosened them up. And all these videos talk about Avis's great tight tolerances. Uh, when it comes to the core, it's actually a lot looser than the first generation ones. Uh, the pin bore holes are much tighter, a little bit smaller. Uh, all the cutout is super small. This core, I actually had to jam in there, and you can see it is like perfectly tight. Where, like on these locks, there's just a bit more space. You can see that. You can see the black area there. Uh, particularly on the steel ones, they can't machine it quite as finely as brass. Brass is really excellent. But we can see on this first generation lock that that second generation core fits all the way in totally flush and is a normal operating lock. Like so. So, which is a nice aspect of these. If I can get this back out. And as a matter of fact, this second generation chrome plated core just won't even, I can't even get it into that lock body. But I was able just with the brass one. But here we have the first generation core. And surprisingly enough, the same thing. You can put it inside a Series 2. And it works just fine. So that's one thing that was important that they did. Also, the last things I forgot to point out inside here is this actuator is pretty much what it looks like inside a first generation which is interesting on these series 2 steel locks is they have kind of a basically a first generation actuator if we can get this to focus in there there we go and there's a little metal washer down in there and that actually retains the spring there's a few videos where they talk about how much of a nightmare it is to deal with the spring that's only on first generation locks. On second generation, they have a little retaining washer, uh, especially on these steel locks. If we can get this little thing out of here. And just clapping it firmly in your hand. And so this is to show on, at least in the steel ones, that little metal washer has this little tab and it holds the spring all in place. So it's this nice uh, one piece unit. We can also see that the steel ones do not have a quick change feature. It's only on the brass locks because there isn't that extra cutout. And to even indeed prove it really is a steel actuator. It's really pretty cool because it's one of the only locks that has that. And it makes it extra strong, extra robust because it's even harder to drive those bearing balls into the actuator itself. And to get the last bit of information out of this video for everybody, this is what they've done on the brass ones. It has a similar spring retainer, surprisingly enough, but then they put in this really weird lock ring in there. I don't think it's an anti-bypass or anything like that. It's just a retaining ring of some type. It also prevents you from over-twisting the core, even if you don't have that infamous little uh, side pin that's inside these cores that also acts as a rotation limiter. On the Series 2 brass locks, it's totally unnecessary because that plate also acts as a rotation limiter so it's doubly over and I'm not sure why they included that on the brass locks and I actually just got this back together uh, why it's not on the steel locks it just you know seems a little confusing to me probably because they figure it doesn't ever corrode on the brass locks and they have an e easy shackle change feature where that does easy change feature does not exist on the steel locks so you have to be able to get that cam out easier uh, in order to change the shackle. That shackle change feature, how it works in practice, in first or second generation is pretty easy. You don't need a special tool, you just use a flathead screwdriver and when it's unlocked, you actually just turn it an extra bit more and then it allows that shackle. You want to hold it this way because that ball bearing can fall out on this side and it just allows you to pull that shackle in and out, just like so. So anyway, that's the end of a really long video about these Abus locks, but I kind of just wanted to make one long video and be done with it instead of having a series of videos where I talk about each aspect. Anyway, I really appreciate everybody watching and subscribing. And if you haven't subscribed, please do. And don't worry, I won't be making many long videos like this in the future. Until next time, Catus Maximus out.